Amen. If you have your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 19 this morning. And the last few weeks, we've been ministering on uh, who we are in Christ and walking in the fullness of it. And if I could, just uh, I'll interject this here. My responsibility as your pastor is not just to, to deliver things to you from God. My responsibility more as a pastor is to equip you to be successful in your walk in Christ. And so the analogy, the, great, the greater analogy is this. It's as if I'm a coach in your life. So I'm a life coach for you. I'm a spiritual coach towards you. God gives gifts to equip us to be successful. Every professional athlete uh, has a coach around them. If you watch, uh, I, I enjoy golf, so I love watching them play golf and stuff. Most people go to sleep when they do it. I watch, I get encouraged, especially when they make bad shots. I go, hey, I've made that shot. <laughs> Amen. And so they're professionals and they make bad shots. So I, I look at that stuff and I think about, hey, I, I watch, when I used to be able to play basketball, I'd watch uh, guys shoot and you watch the pros out there and they shoot air balls. I go, hey, I've made that shot and stuff. But they all have a coach and the purpose of the coach is to equip them to make them better because they see something that they don't see themselves. And golfers will have a swing coach and doing this and help. And, and, and just that little tweak can, can, can bring improvement into your life. My responsibility as your pastor is to bring, to see things or, or as the Lord leads me and to minister in a way that help you perfect your game, if you would. Amen? And, and walking with the Lord so that you are able to achieve your full potential in your walk and your relationship with Christ. And so we've been going through that. We're going to continue on. We have Russell coming next week. Excited for that. And then... Uh, Look forward to having Sharwan. You're going to enjoy Sharwan's testimony because as a child, you saw him and his wife. They are both doctors. And Sharwan, as an eight-year-old boy, made the decision because his mom was having serious uh, uh, physical issues and things. He says, I'm going to become a doctor so I can, my mom can be healed, so I can help my mom and, and doing that. And then we'll find his testimony with Wayne and Sally as he was going to become a doctor. And I want to steal all of his thunder. But he, he, he gets saved. While he's going to school to get saved, he get uh, to become a doctor he gets saved baptized with the holy spirit and then goes back to india instead of pursuing a career he starts serving and ministering to kids in the slum and that's who you partner with through your giving so it's going to be exciting having him and rinku and the children with us amen and uh, so but in dealing with this in We've been on a message, and our title has been, It is Finished, in this little series we've been doing. But in that, we began at Easter, or Resurrection Sunday. And on that day, on, on the cross, Jesus made the declaration, It is finished. And then he gave up his spirit. And we know that he died, went into hell, but he rose victorious over hell. And so we've been preaching on what it is. What is the it that is finished and how does that apply to our life? And so after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples for over 40 days and teaching them, encouraging them. And then at the, on that 40th day, the Bible says that he ascended up into heaven, but he told them as he was ascending, he commissioned said with the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But he said, don't go until you receive the promise of the Father. God never asks us to do anything without equipping us to do it. Whether it's providing for or whatever it is, he makes provision in our life to do what he asks us to do. Amen? And so in doing that, he says, he said, I'm sending you out to preach the gospel, to be my witnesses. But he says, go and tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. And so for 10 days, they're in Jerusalem waiting on the Lord. So they're saved. They've given their life to Christ. They're walking in obedience to what the Lord told them to do. And they're waiting for the promise of the Father. The day of Pentecost comes and God fulfills his promise that he prophesied in joy. He pours his spirit out upon all flesh. Everybody in the upper room is baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they begin to speak in tongues and worship God and praise God, declare his wonderful work. And then Peter stands up and declares, this is that. That was spoken by the prophet Joel. Amen. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said this. He says, they're, they're asking all these spiritual questions that everybody, how many have ever had somebody tell you, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jesus. And they tell you what they're going to ask Jesus. Can I just help you? When you get to heaven, you're going to be so blown away, you're not going to ask anything. And the Bible says when we get there, we will, be know, we will know as we are known. 
So you go from not knowing, you know in part, and when you transfer over, you're going to know all things. Amen? It just, it just got, God just kind of downloads you as you walk, I don't know, through the pearly gates, wherever, however you're going to end up there, whatever. So we get on the rapture elevator. I'm getting going up on the first load myself. Amen? You guys might have to wait for the second elevator to come down, go up, whatever. Anyway, but however you get there, you're going to know as you are known. Amen? And so I'm doing that. But so with that, the disciples are asking Jesus all these questions. When's the kingdom going to come? When are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus says that. Jesus, it was an amazing statement. Jesus said, that's not for you to know. Right. Isn't it amazing how many people are caught up in things today that it's not for them to know? Jesus said, this is what you need to know. In a few days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you're going to receive power. And I like what he says that, to be. Power to be my witnesses. So when we think about ministering for the Lord and, and walking the Lord and serving the Lord, where do, we, where do I get the ability to be what he needs me to be? He equips us with the power to be. Amen? And so that's why Pentecost is so important. And this is what today is a celebration of 50 days after the resurrection and, and Passover and that. And so it's a feast of Pentecost. And Pentecost is 50. It means 50 in that area when you break it down. And so for us today, we're just going to walk through a little bit. Acts chapter 19, I'm actually going to take you back and, and use this encounter that Paul has with the disciples at Ephesus. And we'll go through this fairly quickly. But in this area of he's coming up upon some disciples, and this is several years after. This is actually somewhere around 20 years or so, maybe more, after the resurrection of the Lord. So a lot of time has expired. And so Paul is running into these disciples here, and he asks him this question. And so we're presenting that to us today. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth. Uh, uh, Paul was at Corinth. Excuse me. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And they said to him, we have not so much heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And there are a lot of denominations and groups and factions in Christianity today that really don't speak much about the Holy Spirit or teach on it in his fullness, in the fullness of who Jesus declared the is. Let me just interject this right here. It's amazing and, and it's a good personal Bible study to do to always go back and to read John 14 through 16. In that area, Jesus is speaking in his last meal with his disciples. He literally gives three chapters of the importance of God's spirit coming to be with us. That God, we're moving into what we call a dispensation or the age of God working in his people by and through his spirit. God is with us. When Jesus came and said, his name shall be called Emmanuel, right? God with us. Jesus says, I'm not leaving you. I'm sending my spirit. He's going to be with you. So God is with us in the person of his spirit. God's manifesting, working with us, God with us, his Holy Spirit. Amen? And so Paul is asking, did you receive the spirit when you believe? We have not so much heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. He said to them, into what then were you baptized? Interesting statement. What were you baptized into? So they said into John's baptism. And Paul says, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came what? upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied and so we'll break that down and it says there was about 12 all, all 12 of them those disciples but everybody was baptized with the holy spirit and all of them began to speak in tongue and to prophesy and so we'll break that down for you minute. but let's walk through the introduction on our outline there are some who may not agree and you may not agree with me today but this is my view but i see almost everything that this world has to offer as a counterfeit and a cheap substitute substitute for the real things that the Father has made available to us through Christ for our lives. I believe that's really what the devil does. He offers us substitutes. Everything the world has is a substitute. I shared this in first service in that, and that actually when you go to a restaurant or, and you dine out, most of the times now if they serve alcoholic beverages, there will be a, a your food menu, but then they'll have a beverage menu, and many times on that beverage menu, they have spirits written on there. 
And so it's interesting that they call alcohol spirits. Because that's what happens. And whatever your views are, drinking are, I, I choose not to drink. If leadership for our church, people say, well, what does it, what does it have to do to be a leader? One, you have to support the church financially as a tither, and we ask you not to be a drinker. How you been? So, but if you want to do that, you just do whatever you want. But if you want to be in leadership, we believe we can go to another level. Amen? And so with that, but then this is what happens in there. It's amazing that those are spirits. And Paul says in, Act, in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, he says, don't be drunk. It's an interesting analogy. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. And so this is what happens. Here's the substitute. This is what happens when people begin to drink alcohol. One, it begins to be an influencer in their life. Alcohol is an influencer. And when people begin to become intoxicated, they get bolder than they are naturally. They get louder than they are naturally. They speak more than they do naturally. They do things they would never do if they weren't drinking. Amen? Many of them get happy. They get joyful. You know, all those byproducts are the byproducts of being filled with the Spirit. You do things you wouldn't do naturally. You get bolder than you would never be. You speak in, in ways you would never speak before. Amen. You get, you're supposed to be joyful. Amen. So all that. So it's a counterfeit. That's why Paul said don't be drunk. But, but it's an influence. And it means don't bring yourself. Don't, don't allow a counterfeit to be the influencer of your life. Go for the real thing. Why have a substitute when you can have the real thing? Amen. I still, I, 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 amen. I'm so happy that I don't have to pay to be high anymore. <laughs> and the cool thing with the Holy Spirit, he never gives you a hangover. Amen. The Holy Spirit will never make you hug a toilet and puke your guts out. Amen. <laughs> so you go for whichever spirit you want. Hallelujah. Amen. So the world always tries to, well, let, let me just throw this in too. because it, it, uh, the, the counterfeit of the world is also a bar. People go to a bar. The reason they go to a bar is for fellowship. So people get together, hang out, let's go to the bar, let's fellowship together. They all sit around together, fellowship together, do all that. And then they begin to be filled with the Spirit together. So they choose whatever Spirit, whatever, what they want to be filled with. And then they all go up and get counseling from the pastor behind the bar. Amen. So... This world tries to offer us something in place of what God has given us. It always is a cheap substitute and at best a poor imitation. At best for the real and true promise of God's provision. When we as God's people get hungry for Him, He begins to shine the light of His truth upon all that is false in this world. All the glitter begins to fade away as He reveals to our hearts the true glory and splendor of all that is ours in and through Christ Jesus. And that's what we've been ministering on these last few weeks. When we begin to see who we are in Christ and we begin to understand the complete victory that has been declared to be ours in Christ because of it is finished, something begins to happen. As His people, we begin to call upon His name in purity, in faith, in hope, in worship. And He always responds because when we seek Him, we will find the real thing. Amen? So look inside your outline. So the lie of the enemy comes to us with a strategy. And that strategy has always been to get God's people to become content and satisfied when, with less than what is their rightful inheritance in Christ. The devil wants Christians and believers to, to, to find a place where they just level out in their walk with God and just become satisfied with being that saved. This is good, I'm good, I don't need to go any further, I don't need to go too radical about this. And so as, as, as long as I'm just content to get to that level and stay there, never fully possess, never walk in all that Christ died for us to have, never completely live in it is finished, the enemy is excited because that means we live a powerless life and he knows that. Because what he does is he strips us of our power and authority over him. The devil doesn't want the believer to walk in the authority that Jesus declared we would have. Jesus said, I give you power and authority over all the power of the enemy. Go, therefore, in my name. How, how many know when, when somebody gives you power of attorney and you do business, you are doing business as if you were them? Jesus has given the church the power of authority of his name. So we conduct kingdom business as if we were him. We have full signing authority. Are you doing all right? Yes. 
And so in dealing with that, the devil knows that, but all that authority is to be exercised over the adversary of our soul, and he doesn't want you walking in that. In fact, there are areas, and as we continue on in this series and teaching on this through the year here, we're going to get into the authority of the believer. There are many things that the church will pray about things, and a lot of stuff we're praying about, we're supposed to be declaring and taking and commanding to happen because we've been given the authority, and we're praying and asking God to do it. He said, I've given you the authority to declare it and call it done. I've made you the authority in the earth. Peter, when he came up to the gate beautiful and saw the lame man sitting there, he didn't say, brother, let me pray for you and let's see if it's the Lord's will to heal you. Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold I do not have. But listen to what he said. Such as I have, I give you now in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. That's not a prayer. That's a command. Are you with me? And so that's one instance. Paul, when he's preaching, he sees a young man sitting there who is crippled in his leg and perceiving, the Bible says, perceiving that he had faith to be healed. He said to the young man, stand up and be healed. And the young man immediately was healed. Are you with me? So the devil doesn't want you to know you have that authority. Religion doesn't want you to know you have that authority because religion has learned if we can make the people dependent upon the church, And church leadership, they will need us to do things for them. I am the coach. I'm not playing the game. You're playing the game. I don't want you dependent upon me to win. I need to equip you to win. You guys are missing a great place to shout. Amen. So watch this. So the devil longs to get God's people to advocate their authority to another on their behalf. That's what happened today. Many people turn over all the authority. The nation of Israel said this to Moses. Moses, this lightning and thunder and God speaking stuff, that's a little too much for us. This is what we'll do. You go up and talk to God and you come back and tell us. We'll wait on the other side. So people do that. That's how many people go to church today. They say, Pastor, you go hear from God all week. We'll come in on Sunday. You let us know if he's got a message for us and we'll go, hey, that's That's good. Thank you so much. We'll come back next week, see if he has anything else to say. That's not the way it's supposed to work. Are you doing all right? My responsibility is to get you in a place where you you come into a relationship with God, and you come up saying, Pastor, let me tell you what God tell me. God has shown me this. I'm doing this. I'm walking out. And I go, yeah, hallelujah, amen. But that's what we do. We advocate our authority to somebody else on their behalf, turning over their right and privilege to walk in the fullness of all that is there in life in the spirit. His ultimate goal, the enemy's ultimate goal, is to get the believers to believe that they have something that they have never received. So this morning I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. There are so many people today that think, and there's a, there's a lot of teaching out there that says the moment you get saved, that's all you need. You have it all. You don't need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's no subsequent. There's no after this. So the Bible says here that, that many times the disciples were saved. And then they were in the upper room, they were waiting, they were filled with the Holy Spirit after they were saved. And so every time through the book of Acts are places where people after they were saved, so it can be when you get saved, it can be confirmation, but it's always a subsequent event. Amen. It can be a second later or whatever, but you have to be born again before you can be baptized. Amen. And so it comes, something comes first and something comes second. The time factor isn't really an issue in there, but there can be a space of time or it can be almost instantaneous. So watch this. But the, the devil wants us to think we have something that they have never received, to think that they got it when they have never had it. Amen. Because if we, listen, here, here's the litmus test. If you have it, Jesus said you will receive power. So if we've received the anointing, received the power, where is it? Where's the power? To say, I have it, okay, show me. Years ago when we pastored in Bieber, God sent us there to pastor this little Baptist church that had never, there had never been a move of the Spirit in there, and God sent us there, and I told him, I said, you know what, God, I don't know if we fit. I said, I'm not what you are, and you are not what I am. Amen. I have a Bible experience. I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. I speak in other tongues. Amen. And they go, well, I don't know, but we just like you. Amen. So they like me, so they voted me in. And so three years into this, they were just having this conflict. And, and the conflict really wasn't over anything else. One, they didn't like tongues, some of the, the three, three of the guys there that were the deacon elder board and stuff. And so they didn't like tongues, but they didn't like authority either. And so this one guy goes, hey, you know what? I just think that I've done. You always make a big issue out of that. He goes, my gift is prophecy. I said, brother, I said, I've been here three years. I've never heard you prophesy. 
So it's one thing to declare you have it. I'm sharing that because people declare they have it, but if you have it, it should manifest. If I have power, if I have gifts, they, they, they manifest. God expresses himself. He speaks. Are you with me? And so we've had power. It should be evident in our life. The enemy's desire is for all to become, or let me back up. He wants us to live short of the promise and settle for thinking that this is it. Whatever we have, whatever level we've got, this is it. His desire is for all to become content in the wilderness of your journey. Jesus didn't die for you to live in a wilderness. He died that you might receive the fullness of the promise. Think about it. He never, never expecting or pressing beyond the limitations of their fears to possess the fullness of the promise of their inheritance in Christ. But this is what happens. There comes a day when God sends and encounter our way. I read the, 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 the passage about the men at Ephesus there because here are these men walking around and they think they've received it. They think they got it all, man. We, we've been baptized in John. We've heard a little bit about Jesus, but nobody has explained anything else to them. And then they have an encounter with Paul and he shares the whole truth with them. And look what happened. They get rebaptized in Christ Jesus and then they're baptized with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So an amazing thing happens in their life. For the men at Ephesus, it was the Apostle Paul. And his question was, in essence, did you receive all that is yours when you believe? And that's all I'm asking you today. Have you received all that is yours since you believe? Think about this. If, if you received an inheritance, wouldn't you want to receive it all? I, bet. I would want everything that was mine. This is all in, in the will. It, is it there? And if you read Hebrews chapter 9, it says that you are now, uh, you, you, you've received the will has now been released to you. It's been read. And the provision of the will has been released to us who are the heirs of the will. Amen. We're joint heirs. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So now watch it. And so his concern for them was that they were living with less than what was theirs in Christ. That they had received less than the fullness of their inheritance, yet all the while thinking that they had it all, when as of yet, they were living without the promise of the Spirit in their lives. And so for many, that's, that's what happens. And so over the years, we've seen that. That little church in Bieber, we were there for six years, and we saw God show up in people's lives. And we just began teaching lessons like this on the fullness of God. And then people who all their life been taught one way, next thing you know, they're being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We have people prophesying in church who thought prophecy wasn't for today. We have people laying hands on people. God doing miracles through people's lives, amen, because it's our inheritance. Praise the Lord. So just walk with me for a couple minutes here through the Bible. I'll take you back to Genesis. We're just going to walk through these points and kind of lay a foundation here. And, uh, and then we'll tie a knot in this. See, in the beginning, Genesis, in Genesis, God formed man and breathed into him his, the breath of life. He breathed his, and breathed his life into him, and man became a living being. Genesis 2 and verse 7. God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being, meaning that you and I were formed. God made us, and he formed us to be filled with his life. So he breathes his life into us, and we become alive. And then the Lord says to him, hey, he sets him in a garden. He says, of every tree of the garden you can eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And we know the account that Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They didn't die physically. They, they, they didn't die and expire and not exist anymore. But something happened. They experienced spiritual death. Or in other words, the spirit of God went out of them. God could no longer live in them. So God was outside of them. And that's what we've been trying to talk about. Before we come to Christ, God is an outside God. When we come to Christ, he's in us. And so how do I become God inside minded? So now Adam and Eve are in this relationship. They go from having God in them and in fellowship and communion and being aware of God. Being, watch this, being able to be naked, completely exposed, and not even aware of it. Because they were just one in the spirit with God. Are you with me? But then the moment they, were, they transgressed, now they're self-conscious. Are you with me? And they're covering themselves. And so God is outside of them and no longer in them. And it changes that relationship and their encounter with God. And so in there next. And so 
Ephesians 2 and verses uh, 4 through 8 tell us that you and I were dead in our trespasses and sin because God uh, of that transgression. And then through Christ, we find out that we are given a new Genesis. Titus chapter 3, you can read all these verses. I'm just walking through this quickly, but we can read the verses. But it says that we have been given through the renewing, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. So God now dwelling on the inside, the renewing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit, God now dwelling in us. You say, well, how does that work? So before you come to Christ, (coughs) you're dead in your trespasses and sin, okay? But then you say, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you confess Christ as your Savior, and then old things pass away, and you are now the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? Amen? You're now the righteousness of God in Christ. Not your righteousness, but the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? And so he's been made unto us that wisdom and right. So now we are kings and priests unto our God. And so God, we, we are filled with the life of God. And so this is who we are in Christ. Amen? And... God sees us like that. He no longer sees our old man. The old man, all things have what? All things have become. What I need to do is be able to agree with who I am new and not who I was old. What we continually do is go back down. Well, you know, and we talked about this in our life group. Yeah, but I do. I, I, I still do some of Yeah, but, but, but I, the, I'm putting off the old man and I'm putting on the new man. Here's what happened. In spiritually, the moment you accept Christ, God no longer sees the old man. My problem is I keep seeing it, and I keep trying to put him back on. Because I've been conditioned to act that way, and I'm renewing my mind. I'm being transformed, changed from the inside out. But if I can ever just get myself to agree and speak in agreement with who God says I am. God only sees you righteous in Christ. God only sees you in Christ. He doesn't see you in your old man. He doesn't call you by the old man. He calls you as who you are in Christ. Are you doing all right? And so he just sees you living there. And so now that you're saved, the life of God has been poured into. You are now filled with the life of God. But then that's just not enough. Jesus said that's not enough. And we go on and look there. So Jesus shows up in the upper room with his disciples and he appears to them. He says, don't be afraid. And he breathes on them. And he says, now receive the Holy Spirit. And so the life of God comes back into man. And then he goes, that's good. But now that you have the life, now you're going to go tarry in Jerusalem because it's not just enough for you to have my life in you. I want you also to be clothed with my power. Wait until Jerusalem, until you are endued with power, closed, immersed, submersed in the power of God. Amen? And so, because we have now been made righteous, it's no longer us who qualifies us. We've been qualified by God. Are you doing all right? And so now, but people go, well, that's it. That's all I need. I'm alive in God. I got it all. I have everything. No, you don't. Your still is a baptism for you to experience. So this is the Holy Spirit. And so because I am righteousness, I can now be, I'm qualified to be baptized in him. So I have the life of God in me, but now when I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, are you with me? Now I'm completely in him. Now as we tried to get you to see last week, if I am in him, then in him is every need I have have is met in him. I am in of his fullness we have all received. So not only do I have his life in me, I have his anointing upon me. And I live in him. In him I live and I move and I have my being. And so now in him, because my old man has passed away and I've been declared the righteousness of God, my identity is Christ. So now you no longer see me, you're supposed to see Christ. So now your cup is no longer the issue. It's no longer just about you and your needs and God meeting. No, no, you're completely in him. Are you doing all right? And so that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But religion has told us, well, that's not for today. As long as you're saved, you got it all. No, that's just a, God's an inside job God, but he's a complete outside inside God. Amen? 
And when I live in the fullness of the power of God, I'm walking in all that he is for my life. When you get this revelation in your life and you understand what the baptism of the Holy Spirit produces, the devil no longer pushes you around. Wait a minute. If I'm in him, I'm not doing the work. I'm in there, but you can't see me. It is God in me and on me and through me that's doing everything in my life. I'm no longer limiting God by myself. I, I'm not even visual in the picture. I doing all right. I want to thank Pastor Glenn Berto for that. Amen. And Modesto. I saw him do that illustration. And I posted it and then I added my cups to it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. But if you get that picture, that's who you were. Amen. So we were old, but then we go back and forth. Yeah, but my old man and, and I'll do this. And I, I, I never agree with what God said is dead. Never go back and pick up the old. For some reason, something in the, wants to go back and keep adding this to our life. Just agree with God. Are you doing all right? Just agree with, he's declared you righteous. Let that old thing die. See yourself as the righteousness of God and see yourself completely filled and immersed with the Spirit. Amen? Amen. So that's what Jesus does. And that's what happens on the day of Pentecost. And the disciples begin to declare to everybody, Acts chapter 2, the disciples declare, this is to you and to your children and to as many as afar off. And then what happens? Look at the next page of your outline. They begin... The, the believers begin to walk in the power of the promise, making no small stir. Acts chapter 3, verse chapter 6, you see all these signs, wonders, and miracles being done, multitudes being added to the kingdom. The people are living beyond the normal of their day. Everybody look up here. We should not be living confined by the normal of our day. In fact, I was going back reading, I love reading uh, backwards in, in Christian literature and men and women of God, great heroes who have written books. You go back and read, uh, e. Ian Bounds is, is one of the great apostles on prayer, and, and he was in the late 1800s and right at the turn of the century there, and uh, he was a, a chaplain in the Confederate Army and stuff, and, and, and just amazing life history. But this is what he said in 1893. He says that the, the, uh, the industrial age, and we're just, we're just, we haven't even got cars yet, but just some of the machinery and things that are coming about, he said that, that that's going to become a hindrance to man. And he said this, th th this is one of my favorite statements he has. He says, man is always looking for better methods, but God is always looking for better men. And when men begin to believe who they are in Christ, we don't need all those methods. Amen? Amen. But I was reading it in a book from back in the 80s, even of a, a leader that, that I have quite a few of his books on. And that, but he was talking about, he was talking about, you know what? There, there's inflation. There's an economic recession. There's a price of commodities that are going up. I said, wait a minute. When you just put it in general terms like that, then sounds just like today. And people under the pressure of the price of gas is going up, this is going up, house housing costs are going up, food prices are going up, this is going, oh my gosh, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? Well, you're either going to provide for all of your needs, or you're going to see every need met in Christ. You're either going to believe that God's not big enough, or you can believe that everything, he knows exactly where you are, and he will fully provide for you no matter what's going on around you. Nothing around you changes. Look at the world, you live in an impenetrable zone in God. The world, outside the world. Are you with me? In Him. And in Him, everything is supplied to fullness. Well, pastor, I don't believe that. Well, just read your Bible till you do. Amen. Because that's all you have to do. If you read your Bible, that's exactly what it tells you. If you listen to preachers, Amen. Depend upon what they believe. You're only going to get what they believe. I would rather just preach the word and let the chips fall where they may. You make up your mind. I'm just going to give you the word. You go, well, I, I, people, well, that's too good to be true. Okay, then call it a lie and go on and live in defeat. <laughs> Amen. 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 Uh, people go, well, do, do you believe in that healing stuff? Absolutely. Better than death. Do you believe God still heals the day? Do you believe in that prosperity stuff? No, I think you should be poor, broke, and disgusted your whole life. Amen. Now, could you help us build a building? Oh, come on. Are you listening to me? 
God wants you to prosper, and he wants you to see his goodness and his fullness flowing through your life. He wants you to see God as big as you can imagine him to be. And it's not just an imagination, as big as you can. You can't, that he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you could ever ask or think. Accor- wait, wait, wait. According to the power that now works in us. So he comes in a way that he gets all of his power in us. And he says, if I could ever get you to live in that reality, your world would never be the same. In fact, you wouldn't be influenced by your world. You'd become a world changer. Amen? I'm helping myself this morning. I hope it's blessing you. Amen. So watch it. So this is what begins to happen. And then not only are they filled and they're beginning to do and walk just as Jesus promised they would, but they are able to identify men and women in their midst that are full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit who walked in the power of the Spirit. At every turn, Pushin persecution from the religious crowd arises and tries to stop them from living in the truth and to make them return and settle for the lie or less. Think about it. See, man still wants to be his own God. Religion dies really hard. Because when the truth of God comes on the place, it it strips religion of its power and of its control over people. And religion has gained huge control over people, and so it fights against that. Because for religion to survive, it needs people to depend upon it. Religion wants you to depend upon their dogma. God wants you to be free in relationship with him. Are you doing all right? And so to walk in that freedom and to walk in the authority and the power of God. And so they receive persecution. So when people start preaching on faith, they start preaching that God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Lord. He doesn't change. And people go, well, you know, brother. No, I don't know. I just believe. Amen? Hallelujah. But then think about this. Then one of the deacons gets run out of town. Philip gets run out of town with the persecution. He goes down to Samaria. He used to be in, in, in the church before they had the persecution and got driven out of town. And now he, he, he just ran the food closet ministry. That's what he did. But then when they dispersed the church and the persecution came, then the church scatters. Philip goes down to Samaria and he just starts preaching in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. And a a deacon goes and gets a whole city saved. All of Samaria, he preaches to Samaria. The whole city gets saved. But it says that as he's preaching, it says, but as of yet the Holy Spirit had fallen upon none of them. So they sent Peter and John or sent that they might receive the promise as well. And they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. But after they believed. And so Philip goes down, he preaches to them and they all get saved. They, they believe the old man has passed away. They're the righteousness of God and they're all born again. So there they are. They're all there. They're all born again. Away. But as of yet. The Holy Spirit has not come and fallen upon any of them. Okay, not in them, but upon. Very important. Words are in the Bible for a reason. Amen. 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 And so upon. And so then, after Peter and John laid their hands on, then the Holy Spirit came upon them. And there was a manifestation. And they all began to speak. And such a manifestation that Philip the sorcerer said, that's good. I want to be able to do that trick. The sorcerer thought it was a trick greater than anything he had ever been able to produce. Are you with me? Amen. So in this area, watch this. And then, so a whole city received. And then a short time later, Saul, who was persecuting the church, is confronted by the Lord, converted by the Lord. And he's now walking in obedience to the Lord. He's in town waiting for three days. The Lord told him, go there. He says, okay, Lord, I submit my life to you. I'm going to serve you. He's there waiting on the Lord, praying. And and he's told that a man named Ananias is going to come and lay hands on him to pray for him to receive his sight and to be filled with the Spirit. Ananias walks into the room. You can read it. Brother Saul. The Lord appeared to me in a vision has told me to come lay my hands on you that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Spirit. So Paul is being baptized with the Holy Spirit after already giving his life to Christ. In Acts chapter 10, Peter goes to Cornelius' house and declares that they have and declares that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. What happens is Cornelius is told he's praying, he's seeking the Lord. An angel appears to him, "Go get Paul to come and pray for you." 
and he will tell you words by which you must be saved. And Peter goes, man, that's awesome. So Peter's working on this great salvation message. He gets there and he starts preaching. Just as he begins to preach, the Holy Ghost falls on everybody in the room. They all get baptized with the Holy Spirit, begin speaking in other tongues. And Paul goes, I haven't even got to point two yet. I mean, Peter. Man, this is my greatest message. God just interrupted my greatest salvation message. I worked on this hard. And then God shows up, and everybody gets filled. And then Peter says, hey, because God proved to Peter by the baptism of the Holy Spirit that salvation wasn't just for the Jews. It was for the Gentiles as well. And what that is so significant to you and me is that that's who we are. We're, not, we're the wild branch that's grafted in to the natural tree. Amen? And so that salvation has come to you and I, praise the Lord. And that's what Peter's defense here. They got mad because he was baptizing Gentiles. And he says, who was I to forbid them water, seeing how God had given them the Holy Spirit just like he had given him to us. And Peter said, how did that happen? The same thing happened to them that happened that the Holy Spirit fell on them. And they all began to speak with the other tongue and to prophesy. I don't have time this morning. We did the whole five series or five point series on that, on, on, on speaking in other tongues and how that is available to everyone today. Because people fight against that. Hey, people, well, I, well you know, I think, I, I, well, I'm good. think whatever you like, but just make sure it's the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And doing all that. And so dealing with that. And then lastly, lastly, Apollos is filled with the Spirit. Go with me to Acts chapter 18. You're there. We haven't moved very much. Go back up to verse, chapter 18, verse 24. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord... And being fervent in spirit, in his spirit, spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. Very important. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. In other words, they brought him into a full understanding of Christ and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when he had desired to cross to Acacia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Matt, can you come back to the guitar, please? Amen. You see, like Apollos and the disciples at Ephesus, we all need someone who will take us aside and expound to us the way more accurately. So that we too can live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit, and be used by God for His glory through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. That we, receiving the promise of Pentecost and being filled with the Spirit, can walk in all of its fullness. See, I just declare to you today, it's the will of God for all to be saved, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's God's will for everybody. People say, that's not for today. Well, yes it is, because it's in the Bible. Amen. And nothing passes away. God, listen, Jesus said this, heaven and earth will pass away, but not my word. And yet people tell us today that that passed away, that's not for today. Everything in this Bible is for us today. There's only one being that wants you to believe that this is not for the day, and that's the devil. The devil is the one who diminishes the word of God. Anything that takes away from this word that tells you then the fullness that it's not for today is not coming from God. It's coming from another spirit. Amen? And so I just want to encourage you. I, I, I don't know what you've been told, but I've just watched this my whole life of ministry. Almost 40 years now, 38 years this year in ministry. And this is what I've never really quite understood. That really, it's not too hard to get people to believe that they're sinners because we all have a conscience and we know where we go wrong. And you can get them to accept Christ. The next challenge after that is to get them to believe that they really are righteous in God. And quit speaking about their selves in dead terms. To get their words and their confession to agree with who God says they are. But then the next thing that's even harder than this 
is to get people to accept that they can truly be filled with all the fullness of God and walk in His power. The Bible declares it openly that it belongs to everyone. Believe the promises to you and to your children and your children's children, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, and to as many as are far off, that not only can you have God's life in you, but you can be fully submerged in Him and live and walk in the fullness of His power. Because Christ qualified you. You're qualified in Him. It's not about you qualifying yourself. Jesus did it all. Amen? And I just agree. But I'm always amazed when people say, well, you know, I just don't believe that's for me. And so what I literally do, I just take myself out of the game. And what I'm saying is, same devil, okay, feel free to kick my butt anytime you want. Because what I'm doing is I'm relinquishing all my power and I'm choosing to live in the old instead of in the new. This is his place of dominion over our lives. This is the place where he has no dominion any longer. We shared last week, taken out from under the kingdom of darkness, brought into the kingdom of his son. Amen? Stand with me this morning. See, today it's the will of God that anybody can be born again. And when I'm born again, God breathes his life upon me. And it's his will not only for you to be born again, but every account in the book of Acts where people accepted Christ as their Savior, they were also baptized with his spirit. And Paul was so concerned that people, he had to ask them, Have you, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? You're walking this, but are you walking in the fullness of the promise that is yours? Would you bow your heads with me this morning?